every class and uh, really looking forward to that. I know our children are excited about it. I heard a, a, a little girl asking her mom before service, she's not used to Sunday school now, and she stormed out, and she said, is church over now? And uh, uh, I know that we're not back to power hour yet, and Sunday nights, all that's coming in time, but I'm thankful to be here with you and, and for what the Lord has been doing. Uh, I, just as we begin to feel the presence of the Lord Everything in my nature wanted to push that and see where it went. But God can do more in 30 seconds than we can in 30 years. But I had a moment in altar service Wednesday night standing over here where I felt strongly impressed with regards to what the Lord would have me talk about today. So I don't know who this is for. Just assume it's you. That's what I always do. Amen. Just, just assume it's you. But I want the Lord to help us. When Jesus met the disciples, they were, they were handling nets. They were washing them. And just a few minutes later, he blessed them with a multitude of fish and the nets broke. After three and a half years with him, the Bible said that next time they were fishing, the nets break not. It's not all miraculous moments and God specializes in those. He does. But Jesus made it pretty clear that it's never a waste of time learning how to live. The Bible's a spiritual book, but it's also an immensely practical book. And I want to make sure that if you're not in the moment of an influx of fish in your life, that maybe you're doing everything you can to be prepared for the next one. So with that in mind, Deuteronomy chapter 33 Verse 23, thank you to the guys in the booth. I know Brother Blake's out of pocket working. You're, you're doing a good job. And uh, uh, thank you to everyone who's filling in in classes and music and, and all that good stuff. Deuteronomy 33 and 23, the Lord is doiling out allotments of land, telling Israel, when you move into the kingdom of God from the wilderness, this tribe will live here and that tribe will live there. You don't have to figure it out. You don't have to work it out. God says, I'm telling you where I want you to live by tribes. And of Naphtali, he said, oh, Naphtali, satisfied with favor and full with the blessings of the Lord, possess thou the west and the south. And of Asher. He said let Asher be blessed with children. Let him be acceptable to his brethren. Let him dip his foot in oil. Notice this. Asher thy shoes shall be iron and brass. And as thy days. So shall thy strength be. He said, Asher, I'm giving you shoes, not sandals. I'm giving you shoes made out of iron and brass. And you've got some tough days ahead. But I'm going to give you strength for those same days. The Bible said the race is not to the swift. Then he commanded us to run this race that is set before us with patience. The Bible says a lot about our Christian walk in this life being a race. And so today I want to talk to us about running in brass shoes. Running in brass shoes. Boy, I hope we do a better job than that guy did. Don't do that. Amen. Let's ask the Lord to help us. I love you. Lord, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you, God, for your blessings. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your spirit, what you've done today already, and what you're going to do before we leave. We pray that your word would fall on good ground in every heart and mind. And Lord, that we could collectively and individually again leave here more like you than we are now. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's just thank him together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. We know that God, the Bible said, is just. 
But we also know that life is not necessarily fair. As a matter of fact, it's not fair. And in Matthew 24, when Jesus was giving his greatest dissertation of end time events in order, he told them that, that, that number one, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And then the next thing out of his mouth in verse 15, he told them, he that overcometh, you're going to have to overcome. He said, he that endures. Endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. What an incredible season of endurance we've had to go through as a culture and as a country and, and certainly as a family and my goodness as a church family. I've been praying for family after family. The amount of loss we've had in our church family and our extended family this summer is, is just unparalleled in, in, in my time. And as I was praying the other day and the Lord had so impressed this passage of scripture upon me I thought about a pastor friend of mine and I first heard his story about 22 years ago uh, he pastors not too far outside of Houston Texas and they had started a church there and, and they've given their life to it and God's just blessed and they, they've had immense revival and success and, and I could talk all day long about the good things that God has done for them but when he was about the age I am now their oldest child their 19 year old son was out one Saturday evening and ironically there as, uh, as this pastor and his wife were having dinner he was telling her about a message that the Lord had so strongly impressed on his heart he said if I've ever felt like God just told me what to preach I know exactly what I'm supposed to preach Sunday morning it's just, uh, it's just burning in me it's been a long time since I felt this way about a message and it wasn't two hours later that they received a phone call that there had been a tragedy automobile accident all the kids in the vehicle that attended their church were killed including their 19 year old son it goes without saying that nobody went to sleep that night he was up all night long dealing with it comforting his wife met with all the other parents that had lost children in that circumstance the next morning he's getting ready for service and she said, oh, honey, you're not going to try to preach today, are you? He said, I don't have any choice but to preach. The Lord's already told me what to say. She said, surely you could save that for a week or two. And he looked at her and he said, he's gone. And I'm heartbroken. And there's nothing we can do to bring him back. When I come home, I'll fall apart again. He said, but I've got a word from God. And there are going to be people there to hear it. I was reading this passage of scripture thinking about him. And all the years that's gone by. It's so fresh in his heart and his mind even now. Some people don't get to live the easy life. And even people you look at and think they're exceptionally blessed. Because their house is a little bigger or their car is a little uh, shinier. And their vacations are a little more exotic. Life is so much more than what we can see with the naked eye. And I dare say that it's one thing to learn to handle success or blessings. But when the bottom falls out and it falls out for everybody one day in one way or another. It's still he that endureth unto the end. The same shall be saved. And all of us have to get where Job got at some point. Covered in ashes and sackcloth. Thrusting a finger into the air. Saying God even if it kills me. I want you to know that I trust in you. Now in our scripture text. God was allotting the land to the nation of Israel. They had been slaves for 400 years. And then they had been in the wilderness. And now they're finally going to go. And inhabit the land that God had promised to their great grandfather Abraham and God's given them that land he says Naphtali you're going to be satisfied with favor you get to live down south boy we know that's the word of God you get to live down south where God wants people to live and uh, you're just going to be blessed and all these great things are going to happen to you but then he turned to Asher and he said you're not going to get the same kind of land that some of these guys are going to get you're not going to live where some of these folks live you've got some rocky terrain in your future but you you listen to me I'm giving you shoes that are iron and brass when you go into a shoe store 
if you happen to be a woman, you spend five to eight hours looking at shoes. And when you find the perfect one, you walk to the counter and say, do you have this but with a different heel and a different color and a different size? This is the part where I, I know why they put bookstores in malls so husbands will have something to do while their wife shops for shoes. But in the Lord's shoe store, it, looks, it works a little bit differently. I thought about this when I was standing uh, in a conference and they had this convention center set up and you got people selling ties and people selling shoes and people selling purses and you know all these things and I heard a guy there he called somebody I guess he was a regular customer he said Frank he said I've got your shoes right here he said I didn't order any shoes he said but I knew you'd be here and I knew you were going to want them when you saw them. I chuckled and Frank walked over and bought a pair of shoes. I said, I'm getting away from that guy. I can't afford to know him. That's how the Lord works. You need to come here. I've got your shoes around. I didn't order any shoes. No, but I knew where you were headed. And I ordered them for you. It's not by accident that Paul said your feet have to be shod with a gospel of peace. It's that peace that passes all understanding. Because somewhere along the line when my life's in chaos. Somewhere along the line when we're dealing with frustration and heartache and loss and hurt. I've got to understand. He knew what was in my path before I even got here and he's going to equip me to be able to climb what is in front of me see Asher's inheritance God's lot for his life this tribe got land it was not fertile plains it wasn't beachfront property it wasn't that soil just rich that was going to yield large crops it wasn't a land for comfortable sandals it wasn't a place for barefoot living he didn't need water shoes that wouldn't protect your feet. He said, your shoes are going to be iron and brass. He said, where I'm sending you, I'm not changing the terrain for you. I'm not changing the circumstances for you. I can't even alter your path. I'm not changing the environment, but I'm building you and equipping you for what you've got to live through. And before you even get there, I want you to know that as your days are, so shall your strength be. Now stick with me. We're going somewhere. Naaman the leper had an Assyrian slave. The Assyrian had a Jewish girl that they had taken in a raid. And she was a slave now. And he brought her home. And she began to serve his wife in their house. And I often marvel there's still a king in Israel. There's still a nation. And this girl is taken away. And this girl is enslaved. And I asked so many questions. And this girl had every right to say if God's real. And I've served him. And I love him. Why would he ever let this happen? to me how are my circumstances fair how can she live like she's lived and she's still at home but I've done everything right and here I am in the hands of our enemy and suffering loss she could have done that but she didn't instead she looked at her leprous slave owning captor and said I would to God that my master was in Samaria for there is a prophet of the Lord there who would heal him here this girl is being a witness to the man that has destroyed her life she's sharing a message of hope with a human being who's taken everything away from her because she's not just standing there she's got iron and brass shoes on she is in pain she has suffered immeasurable loss but she is utterly faithful now we're almost there next Sunday will be uh, our 23rd wedding anniversary and somebody asked me how you make it 23 years. It's real easy. You just, you just kind of don't quit. You know, it's, it's, I just had a birthday and it feels strange. People say congratulations on not dying again. It's all I've done. You just keep breathing and eating too much. And here I am. When we got married, we made an agreement that, that, that the word divorce was never going to pass between us. It just, that whatever happens, happens. Whatever we go through, we go through. But whatever that is, we're going to go through it together. And that only works, number one, if you both feel that way. 
And number two, if there's not a plan B, just, just an A. Okay, in living for God, I figured this out. He's not ever going to leave me and he's not going to forsake me. So I can't have a plan B. It may not always be sunshine. It may not always be fun. It may not always be easy. But he's still the brightest spot in my life. And no matter what people put me through or life throws at me or whatever I have to endure, as long as I know thou art with me once we lock into that mindset I don't have to make a living but I have to make it to heaven I don't have to make a relationship work but I have to make it to heaven I don't have to be happy every day but I've got to live for him every day once I wrap my brain or it takes iron and brass shoes to live for God in our generation David had been through so much and once he came to the throne he wanted to show mercy to his friend Jonathan's descendants and he said is there anybody from the house of Jonathan left that I might show mercy and the only man left was Jonathan's son Mephibosheth and Mephibosheth had been injured by a nurse she picked him up to run with him she was not trying to hurt him she was trying to help him but in a clumsy moment she dropped him and he was permanently handicapped he was physically mangled and the way their culture worked his life was ruined and could have even been forfeit and she didn't do that on purpose she was trying to help him when she heard him but now David finds out about him and he calls him into the palace and he calls him into the, the king's courtroom and he's standing before the king only he's unable to stand he's kneeling before him because he has to and in that moment when David's law had forbid him but David's word had called him forth he didn't point at that woman and say she did this to me it's not my fault I'm in the shape that I'm in my grandpa threw the family away and when he made his mistakes the sword came to our house and then that woman who was supposed to protect me destroyed me it's not my fault I want to tell you as you live through your life a lot of things are going to happen to you and they're not all going to be your fault and you're not going to get an explanation for all of them but at some point we've all got to just make our mind up and make a decision am I going to spend the rest of my life pointing fingers at whose fault all my troubles are and explaining how I got here and why I'm here let me say something that I say around here a lot it doesn't have to be your fault to be your problem it's not my fault I'm a diabetic but it's my problem we've got a basketball court in the gym it's not my fault I'm short but it's my problem it's not my fault I'm slow. I was slow when I was skinny, but it's my problem. It's not my fault I'm getting the tiniest bald spot. It's not going to be my problem either. I don't look back there. That's your problem. We've all got our issues. But here Mephibosheth is without excuse. He's not pointing fingers backwards or sideways. He just humbled himself and said, I am as a dead dog. And David said, you're going to sit at the king's table for the rest of your life. This is so simple. As long as I try to assign blame, as long as I point fingers, as long as I keep acid in my spirit, I'll miss the whole point. But if I want to get to where the help comes, comes from and where the substance comes from I've just got to humble myself own it all and understand that being offended is a choice that I make yes, yes, that's good. I can't help what people do to me or what they say to me but being offended is my decision right. in the modern church world we've replaced that convicts me with that offends me the point of preaching used to be to bring conviction. Yeah. Now you're supposed to filter every phrase to make sure you don't offend anyone. We've got the entire pyramid upside down. I choose to be offended or not to be. There's a Syrophoenician woman. Her daughter's possessed with a devil, literally. And she sought out Jesus. And when she tried to get him to help, she portrayed herself as a Jew. But he saw right through that. He said, it's not meat to take the children's bread and cast it under the dogs. I've come to my own. And here this woman is. She humbles herself and says, truth, Lord. But even the dogs eat from the crumbs under the children 
children's table. Now, when he said that to her, she could have gotten angry. She could have been offended. She could have been frustrated. She could have walked out and slammed the door. I'm never going to deal with him again. Who in the world? How racist is that? That he's not going to deliver my baby just because we're not Jews? This is wrong. This is backward. This is incorrect. She could have gotten angry, but it never would have helped her daughter at all. But this woman had iron and brass shoes on. She climbed right over that mountain because she understood I'm not here to be included. I'm not here to be helped. I, I, I'm just here because I've got to have a miracle. Nothing else is going to take care of her. And I'm not going to let anything get in me that will get between me and the help I need. One of the brightest men who ever lived. It's a preacher of the gospel with a photographic memory. He could quote, I know the entire New Testament. He retained everything he read. He retained everything he heard. He was dying after a long battle with Alzheimer's. And his son, my friend, had flown out to spend time with his parents. He was walking him through a mall in California. And while he's helping his dad through the mall... One of the last times he was able to get him out. Going right by them came a man in his 80s wearing a sleeveless shirt and a Speedo. 30-year-old woman on his arm puffing a cigar and cussing a blue streak. He just laughed and shook his head. He said, my first thought is I hope I have his energy when I'm his age. He said, but then I looked at my dad. I thought, God, he could have been a rich man. He gave his entire life to you and to your kingdom. I don't wish that guy any harm. But how can he be living that way and my dad's practically his age and can't tie his own shoes or sign his own name? And no quicker had that passed his lips than a scripture was just impressed on his mind. John chapter 21, let's read this, verse 18. They're having a moment. He that believeth, oh, that's John 3. I got it. Peter's a young man. He's a young man, and the Lord's telling him, Peter, thou art young, but when thou shalt be old. Right now you go where you want to go, and you do what you want to do, but one day you're going to be old. And when you're old, they're going to lead you where you don't want to go. And the Bible said by this he spake of the death by which Peter would glorify him. All right, we got that. Skip down. 19. This spake he. Okay. But Peter. Whoa. <laughs> Let's go to verse 20. Then Peter turning about seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? 21. Peter seeing him said to Jesus, and what shall this man do? Now catch this. Leave that up on 22. God came down and said, I got some bad news for you, Bubba. You're going to die to further my kingdom and glorify my name. But relax because you're going to be old when it happens. You know what Peter does? It seems reasonable. What about that guy? I mean, if I've got to give my life for you, I'll give my life for you. But what about that dirt bag over there? <laughs> I just want to make sure while I'm being crucified upside down, he's not playing golf in sunny Arizona at a retirement community. I mean, Lord, I'll give up everything I've got and, and go broke to be a minister. I just want to make sure that this dirt bag's not a millionaire while I'm doing it. Do you know people like that? Lord, I'll give you everything I got, but I want to know he's got to give everything he's got too. What shall this man do? Verse 22. Then Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, 
If I let him live 2,000 years and he leaves in the rapture, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. It's not about who else has got it better, who's feeling better, who's doing better, who got the miracle, who didn't. It's about following Jesus. It's not who's healthy and who's sick, who's rich and who's poor, who's tall and who's short. It's about following Jesus. It's not about who has 10 kids and who can never have one. It's about following Jesus. Jesus he called us to be faithful maybe you inherit a beach maybe it's flat fertile land maybe it's a beautiful mountain or maybe there's obstacles and stones but as long as I can be in the kingdom as long as I can be pleasing to the king told you the story of our first missionary to Columbia He pioneered a missions work there, Brother Larson. The government fought him fiercely. Fought him fiercely. They wanted there to be one particular church in the country. Couldn't get a building. His wife was expecting and they went so far to make sure that no physician would treat her and the baby. So then... He had to deliver the child at home and there were massive complications and the baby lived. But his wife died. They took it a step further and made sure that no funeral home would service her remains. Here he is weeping and praying, holding his firstborn child with his wife laying gone on their bed. And he said, one of the first times in his life, he felt like God spoke to him. And the Lord said, you cry to me all you need, but never outside of this house. They're watching you and I'm going to take care of you. So he got up on a Saturday morning. Placed his baby in a bassinet he had rolled outside. And his wife in a coffin he had made with his own hands. He dug a hole. And neighbors began to gather around the backyard fence. He lowered her into it. He sang three songs, preached his own wife's funeral, and prayed for her. Picked the baby up, smiled and nodded at each of them, and went back inside. He didn't know this. And it's a long story. But a few of those neighbors were influential folks. And they set about first locally to make sure that nobody would bother him or the work there again. And revival broke out in that town. And it became a springboard for a thriving, thriving church that planted churches all over the country. Hundreds of thousands of saints received the Holy Ghost in Columbia. And it all began With a heartbroken, flattened man who was willing when he lost the love of his life to lace up iron and brass shoes. Say, I'm going to cry all I need to cry. But when I stand in front of this lost world, I'm going to talk to them about him. And one of the greatest revivals to come to a nation in the last 75 years was the product of one man's brass shoes. I want to tell you, none of us want to limp through life. None of us want to need that kind of heartache or shell or protection. None of us want to work when we're injured. And none of us want to play hurt. But ye are not your own. Ye are bought with a price. All the stories we can tell men and women in this room right now who have endured heartache and loss and frustration but here you are and look at what God's done because of what you have done I I gotta quit I shared the story standing right over here with somebody after church Wednesday night I've got a redneck buddy got a lot of them where I grew up we were four-wheelers and hunting one day. I preached a whole message about this about three years ago, I think. We were, we were four-wheeling and hunting. We're young guys, and he's telling us the story. 
when he was a baby on a pallet in the floor and his dad's carrying boiling hot water and tripped on an upturned rug and dumped that scalding hot water on his infant leg. From his knee to his ankle was completely mangled. There were surgeries with an S and skin grafts with an S. He had third degree burns from the knee down to the foot. And, and, and we asked him, a friend of mine, he says, is that still scarred? He said, oh yeah, it'll always be scarred. He said, from your knee to your ankle is scarred? Now Tommy's not a wordsmith. He said, no dummy. He said, when you're a baby, your knee to your ankle is about that big. He said, the scar's the same size it's always been, but I got bigger than my scar. I thought about that in a prayer meeting one time, and I realized we're all going to take some lumps, and they're not all equal. And I'll not compare what I've gone through with what you've gone through, or God forbid what you're going through right now. But I want to tell you that your scars do not grow, and you're in a place with a God that can help you become bigger and better. It doesn't cover my whole life anymore. It doesn't cover my whole heart anymore. It doesn't consume my entire mind anymore I can get bigger than my star Let, let's stand together I know what time it is Barcelona Spain the site of the 1992 Olympic Games the odds on favorite to win gold in the 400 meter dash was a young man named Derek Redmond he was the pride of Britain's Olympic team that year. He was in a class by himself. One sports writer who interviewed him years later said when the gun was fired, Redmond fired out too. He easily pulled ahead of the field. 120 meters into the race, the race was over. But then he blew a hamstring and found himself bleeding and face down on the ground everyone that he had blown out of the water came streaking by Redmond said when I saw the stretcher bearers coming I thought no I've prepared my entire life to run this race I'll not be carried off the track so he rose and waved them off and on one leg he began to hop down lane five of Olympic Stadium. In section 110, row 25, seat 2, up jumped a giant man, his dad, who they called Big Jim. This was pre-9-11. He literally bowled through the two security guards there. And before anybody could stop him, he was on the track with his son. He said, Derek, you don't have to do this. He said, Dad, I'm going to do this. By now the medals have been won. The race is over. Everybody else has stopped and they're watching them. He said, if you're going to do this, then I'm going to help you. Redmond said, keep me in my lane or I'll be disqualified. And he put his arm around his dad and began to hop. The silent crowd stood while father and son traveled the final 280 meters the finish line dad let go and Derek jumped across by himself and a stunned crowd stood and gave a deafening ovation the writer said I don't remember who won the gold that day or even what nation they held from and it's not important but as long as I live I'll never forget the young man who was determined to finish his race at any cost I'm not comparing my cost to yours it's not realistic it's not fair and it's not even important but I am here to tell you that you have a heavenly father 
And it may feel like he's just a spectator watching you struggle through life. It, you may wonder why he's not already here. He's not already doing this and hasn't put his hand to that. But I can promise you because of this book and my own experience these last decades. If you'll just grit your teeth and make your mind up. I might have to hop. I might have to crawl. But I'm going to finish. Honey, he'll bail out of the bleachers before you can bleak your eyes and be right there with his arm around you. That's what it means to cast all my cares upon you. I'm not going to quit. I can't give this up. The very end of his life. Paul's writing to his son in the gospel. I'm now ready to be offered. Don't want you worried about it, Bubba. I'm ready for this. He said, I've fought the good fight, and it's a fight sometimes. I finished the course, and I kept the faith. Not even the great apostle who wrote over half of our New Testament could say, I kept the course. If you think you've kept the course all your life, you're fooling yourself. We've all gotten off course. Some of us get way off course. Some for a little while and some for a long while. He said, I didn't keep the course, but I kept my faith. I had to wrap my arm around my dad, but I finished. I finished. I finished. I didn't quit. I ran this thing. It wasn't fast. It was patient. I had to wear iron and brass shoes to get through some of this or I would have been crushed by it. But I'm a finisher. I'm a finisher. I tell you what it's going to take. Some of us just have to lace them up and say whatever it is, it is. Whatever. Whatever it costs, it costs. Whatever it takes, it takes. But I'm not going to let what he did or what she put me through or what they thought. I can't let that get between me and Jesus. I've got to finish. Can we lift our hearts to him right now? Would you close your eyes? Come on, not looking around. God, right now, right where I am. Right now, right where I am. I pray for your help to be upon me. In Jesus' name. Lord, I've got to finish my race. I've got to finish my course. When I stand before you, I want it to be a thing of triumph and peace. I don't have to be like him. I don't have to be like her. But I've got to be like you. I've got to be saved today, Jesus. In Jesus' name, thank you. Can we just find a place to talk to him right now? Can we find a place to talk to him? If you're playing hurt, keep playing. If you're running injured, keep running. If you're fighting weak, keep fighting.